الحمد لله نحمده نستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساءة من يدع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصهما فلا يضر إلا نفسه أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يبقى قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وزبنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا وزبنا اجتنابا آمين يا رب العالمين Inshallah, today we will finish off this passage of the Qur'an. And just so that people know, <coughs> my style of khutbah will be as follows. One session, when I say session, it could mean one khutbah or more than one khutbah. One khutbah will be on some dars from the Qur'an. And then another session will be on some issue related to society or our community <coughs> issues. So one session, will be like, let's say I'm doing right now Sulfusilat, some ayat Sulfusilat. This may last two, three weeks. Then I may take up something like parenting tips or something to do with our society, our community. And I may talk about that for a few weeks. And like this, switching between the root dars of Quran and social issues, I will be uh, fluctuating between those two back and forth. So this, just so that it's clear in your mind. And uh, for the last few weeks, we have been doing uh, Sutul Fussilat, and uh, I started off talking about the concept of what is Rabb, and Rabb versus the concept of Allah, how that is different from Rabb. And then I had talked about some of the verses in this passage. I'm going to be continuing on those verses and in that passage today, and inshallah we will finish off. And next week I will be talking about some of the things that relate to our social issues or community issues and taking it from there. <clears throat> Let me just uh, review some basic things and then from there we will move forward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَا اللَّهُ Indeed, those people who said Allah is our Rabb. One very easy way to understand the di distinction between Allah and Rabb is this. That shaitan accepts Allah. Shaitan who knows Allah. He accepts Allah as Allah. But he does not accept that relationship between Abd and Rabb. He doesn't, shaitan accepts Allah as Allah. He knows Allah exists. But he doesn't accept Allah as his master. So he denies Allah being Rabb, so to say. And him being Abd. And but he accepts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being as Allah. I just wanted to make this point as we continue. So, Indeed, those people who said, Allah is our Rabb. Thumma staqamu. Now, interesting thing here is, Thumma. Thumma, it could have, Allah could have said, for example, Inna ladhina qalu rabbuna Allahu fastaqamu. Indeed, those people who said, Allah is our Rabb. Fa, here, fa sababiyah would mean, immediately they become istiqamu. They immediately had istiqamah. They immediately had steadfastness. But Allah doesn't say this. Allah instead says, "Inna ladina qalu rabbuna Allah thumma staqamu." Then after, because it doesn't, it takes time. You know, spiritual development takes time, just like physical development. If you run five miles the first day, the next day you won't be able to run anything because you'll be too tired because the first day you ran five miles. So anyone who wants to grow spiritually has to grow spiritually in a proper pace, in a pace that, is, <laughs> that he's able to manage. So first day you run maybe half a mile, and then you get good at that, and then you go one mile, and then two miles, and three miles. The stage between, the stage between, <laughs> this middle stage is discussed in this same section in, in, in a few ayahs later, and the word for that is sabr which I will discuss with the word sabr. No, in fact, I will 
mention it here. The word sabr in Arabic comes from the word sibr in Arabic. Sabr comes from sibr. The derivative word is sibr. Sibr is, you know, alloy is medicine. And it tastes very bitter. Like the Prophet sallallahu there's a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-ghadabu yufsidu al-imanu. Anger destroys your iman or, or causes problems in your iman. Kama yufsidu al-sibru ala al-asr. Just as alloy, which is a bitter medicine in the time of Arabia, I don't know, we would have to ask a doctor today if this is still used. I know it's used in some of the lotions and stuff, alloy, A-L-O-E. And uh, it tastes very bitter. So just the concept of sabr, which we usually call patience, and some people have translated it as steadfastness. The concept is, you have to take the medicine. Even if you don't want to, you still Force yourself to take the medicine, even though it doesn't taste good. But you take the medicine. So you know you have to do something, and you are, you can say, persistent on it. That you're going to take something, even though you don't like it, you're going to do it. So this is, the concept of sabr is just like this. Sabr is to be in a situation that you don't like. But you are willfully, by your willpower, putting yourself through a situation that you don't like because you know it's best for you in the long term. Then that sabr, that sabr then becomes over time istiqama. It starts as sabr. And we'll discuss this inshallah in the coming ayahs. So, inna ladina qalun rabbun Allah. Those people who have declared that Allah is their master or Allah is their Rabb. And they have now because, you know, in one house there cannot be two masters. In one house there can be only one master. Now this personality that is accepted, okay, I have to, come what may, I have to surrender to Allah. Come what may, He is my master. Now this personality can't hold within himself what he knows about his master. He can't because he has to now propagate to it. Because it's human nature. When you like something or you know something, you really feel strongly about it. You're emotional about something. <laughs> you have an emotional connection to something and especially if something has become part of your identity, your personal identity, something has become part of your identity, then you can't not st you cannot withhold it from telling other people about it. It's just natural. Anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in describing these people, Allah first talks about that Allah will protect them. Now, this surah was revealed at a time, this is a Makki surah, and it was revealed at a time where the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, where they were going through a lot of hardship. And this was their actual training. If you want to know, you know, the training of the Sahaba was the difficulties that they were willing to go, and their ranking, the ranking of the Sahaba was also based upon the difficult situations. The Sahaba of Ashram al-Bashra, for example. The Sahaba of Badri. Why Badri? Because of the difficulty of Badr. Why the Sahaba of Bayt al-Ridwan, that Allah has given the Bishara, the the people, because of the difficulty of the situation. So the difficulty, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the companions of the Prophet that accepted Islam before the victory, before after the victory, everyone was entering Islam. There was no difficulty. But the, the people, the companions of the Prophet that accepted Islam before the victory, they were going through all the difficulties before the victory. Their ranks are higher in ranks than, uh, uh, than those people that just accepted Islam after the victory. This is in Quran, by the way. So, Surah so Al-Hadid specifically. So, uh, or, that not equal to you are those people who spent and fought before the victory than after the victory. So, the ranking of even the companions of the Prophet was diff the difficulty of the situation. So the point I'm trying to make is how much someone was invested, how much their personality was invested in the cause of Islam and in their relationship with Allah was directly proportionate to the difficulties that they had to bear from the beginning to the end of their uh, their quest with the Prophet Okay, so Allah says about those people to console them, to comfort them, to uh, give them, because for them they're just seeing, you know, death in front of them every day. 
uh, they are the few of the companions who had accepted Islam in Mecca. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُوا عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ The angels come down upon them. Last time I went through this, so I'll go through this quickly. The only issue here is when this happens, does this happen in the field, in our lives? Or some scholars have the opinion this happens at the moment of death. And then some people feel it happens in the Akhirah. Allahu Alam, we don't know. So, تَتَنَزَّلُوا عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ The angels come down upon them and they say, Allah تَخَافُوا Don't be fearful. وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ And don't be sad, but have the good news of Jannah. جَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَدُونَ That Jannah, that paradise that you have been promised. Now, if somebody reads Qur'an, and you ever get a feel, an emotional feel, not just an emotional feel of the wordings of Jannah, or if you ever heard a scholar talk about Jannah, describe Jannah, and if you just listen to it, it's, it's very attractive, it's very powerful description. Anyway, so, uh, تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَدُونَ نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا We were your protectors, we are your protectors, depending upon the translation, in this life. نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ and in the آخِرَةِ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِيَ أَنْفُسَكُمْ And now, you can have for yourself whatever you desire. Here, this has come in مقابل of the sabr, the istiqama and sabr. Because istiqama and sabr are in the same, uh, two aspects of the same thing. Like I said, sabr is the early phases of the same phenomenon. And istiqama is the later phases. Actually, let me explain sabr a little bit more. There are three types of sabr. Number one, which is the relevance of this ayah. Sabr fi sabilillah. Sabr fi ata'atillah. Sabr in the cause of Allah or in the obedience of Allah. Both of these are the same. So you have you don't want to do you have to pray, but you don't feel like praying. Wudu is hard. In the beginning it's hard. But then that wudu becomes easy after some time. It becomes a habit a habit. It becomes easy. But in the beginning it's hard. You have to force yourself in the beginning. But then after some time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for someone. So one type of sabr is Sabr fi sabilillah. Sabr in the cause of Allah. Or sabr fi ta'atillah. Sabr anil ma'asiyah. Having patience and steadfastness from doing ma'asiyah, from disobeying Allah. You feel like disobeying Allah. You are inclined to disobey Allah, but you keep yourself from, you have sabr. You hold yourself from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after some time, that thing that was so difficult because you hold yourself, because Allah doesn't make it difficult forever. forever. Allah makes it easy after some time. Then that thing that was difficult then becomes easy. <coughs> when it becomes an adha, when you're used to that sabr, when that thing that you were doing sabr over, like for, I'll give you an example. The brothers who become Muslim, you can talk to them and ask them. If they used to drink alcohol, it doesn't happen that the taste of alcohol has totally left them. No. They still have the memory of that. They still know that it has a lazza. They still know it has some deliciousness, some, some, something uh, attractive about it. They still remember this. But they have done so much sabr over it over the years. They've done so much sabr over it that they have istiqama over it. They have, uh, you could say, st steadfastness. Over. They've conquered it, so to say. But it's still there. The memory is still there. And you can talk to a non-Muslim about this, I mean a Muslim who, who was non-Muslim and then became Muslim, about this experience. Because it's a very interesting phenomenon. I don't know if how many of you people have realized, but two things I'll share with you regarding this issue of sabr. And the example of that here in the United States. The United States is the place where the largest in mass conversion or reversion, however you like to say it, to Islam has ever happened in the, high, in the entire history of Islam. Two million African Americans accepted Islam within 10 years. Two million. Never, you know how long it took even Syria for Syria to become predominantly Muslim. Syria was Christian. It took up to 300 to 400 years before it became predominantly Christian. So you had two million people who accept Islam within a 10 year period in the 60s. This was a, a fabulous time in America 
where Malcolm X was there and, and a lot of other things were happening. And there were so many Islamic movements that people are not even aware of that are part of our history now in America. But anyway, the second thing I wanted to mention, when that happened, when they converted to Islam, whether they were with Wadisti Muhammad or they were not with Wadisti Muhammad, what happened? They established their communities. Over here, just in Washington, D.C., you can go to the Masjid of Musa Abdul Alim. Maybe some of you know him. He used to be uh, a well-known speaker at one time. Even he used to speak at Isna at one time. But anyway, African-American communities, Muslims living together, they have a masjid, small communities. But they have small communities where they live together and you know they, they know each other and they have established Islam and these people, they let go their alcohol, let go their drugs. I mean, they didn't only have to deal with alcohol, they had to deal with a lot of other stuff. Let it go. How did two million people let go all these vices or evils of society? How did they let it go? It happened that it was hard in the beginning, but then Allah makes it easy, especially when you have a support system, when you have a community with you, who have become your friends and you have allied with them and they're in the same cause as you, it becomes easier anyway. So the point that the largest conversion of Islam happened here in the U.S. And uh, uh, I won't go into more about that right now. Anyway, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so about sabr, I said, there is sabr fi ata'atillah or fi sabilillah. Sabr anil ma'asiyah. Sabr in having patience from doing disobedience of Allah. And then the third is, you know, common human sabr fil musibah or sabr ala al-musibah, sorry. Sabr over difficulties that come in your life. Dif difficulties happen, uh, things happen in life and they become difficulties. So sabr on these three things. So all of these three things, but in this ayah, particularly what is being referenced to is sabr fi sabilillah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about those people that they will be in paradise. I will be their host, they will be my guest. Nuzulam min ghafur rahim. Now who are they? What is their quality? <coughs> Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ Who is more better? Who is greater? وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا Who can be better in speech is the literal translation, but I'll explain this word. قَوْلًا is very important here. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ Who can be better in speech? Now those people are being described. In speech, then the people that are calling towards Allah. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا But this person, He's not only calling towards Allah, وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا He's doing good things himself. It's not just a waz, you know, oh, uh, believe in Allah. No, but he himself is practicing. وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And he declares, he says, that indeed I am also of those people who have surrendered to Allah. I am also trying to surrender. I'm one of the Muslims, but I'm nothing more than that. I'm just one of the Muslims. So over here, the word قَوْل is very interesting. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعِنَ اللَّهِ I want to give you some examples of this word قَوْل that relates to this. For example, Allah subhanahu the word قَوْل is used in Qur'an for Qur'an. So one is وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا Who can be better in statement? Who can be better in speech? Who can be better in wa'az, in preaching, so to say? Than the one who calls towards Allah. This is one explanation. The other is, for example, Allah subhanahu wa says in the Qur'an سَنُلْقِي عَلَيْكَ قَوْلًا ثَقِيلًا O Muhammad we're going to reveal upon you heavy قول, heavy words. قول is the word. قول. إِنَّهُ قَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ This is a word, meaning Qur'an, is from a Rasulin Kareem. In the same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in, in many places in the Qur'an, the word قول is used for the Qur'an. I'll give you, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرٍ وَمَا هُوَ بِ Meaning this Qur'an, وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرٍ وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنٍ All of these, the word قَوْل is referring to the Qur'an. This is the point I'm trying to make. So now if you look at the ayah with this in mind, I have some more ayahs. If I could just go over. وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ سَنُلْقِي عَلَيْكَ قَوْلًا ثَقِيلًا In the same, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلٌ فَصْرٍ وَمَا أَجَلْسَ so we have some of the enough ayahs that I made my point. So anyway, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word qawl to mean Qur'an. So then the translation will become وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا Who can be better in qawl? Meaning the, the words of Qur'an. Meaning Allah was the Qur'an. 
And there's an example of this in this very passage, but uh, let me explain this. When they said, you're a sahir, you're a majnoon, you're a kathab, to the Prophet you're a magician, you are a liar, you are have gone crazy. What are they reacting to? What are they reacting to? They're reacting, they are, re not Muslims are reacting, not like you know how we react over here, Mecca was reacting to the Prophet. The Prophet comes with a message and they are saying, oh no, no, this is magic. Don't listen to the Quran, right? So the Prophet's way of doing da'wah was whoever came to the Prophet, if you read the ahadith, especially the Makki ahadith, it's very clear. Whoever came to the Prophet, the Prophet would read Quran to him. Uthman radiallahu anh. How did Umar radiallahu anh become Muslim? He was the worst enemy of the Prophet, became the best by listening to the 10 ayat of Surah Al-Taha, which is indirectly mentioned in this coming ayah. So Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا Who can be better in speech or who can be better in doing da'wah other than that he calls people to the book of Allah. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا And he does what that book says. He does what that book says. وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ And he says, إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And he says, I'm amongst the Muslims. But now, interesting point here is, Muslims in Mecca were weak. So this was a very important point of the Qur'an and a very, one of the few enforced rules of the Prophet in Mecca. Which was, Keep your hands tied. Do not retaliate. Even if they kill you. When Yasin and Sumayyah were being killed, where was Omar and Hamza? He can't do anything. The Prophet had said, no retaliation. No matter what they do to you. No matter what happens, you cannot retaliate. And one Sahabi, Abu, Abu Dhar Ghaffari radiallahu anh, he retaliated and the Prophet sallallahu told him, leave Mecca. Because of him, the whole the Muslims could be put into a dangerous situation where if one person is retaliated and the Muslims are weak, the rest of them could be obliterated. So Abu Dhar Ghaffari radiallahu anh, he hit Abu Jahl and the Prophet told him, leave Mecca. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make here, إِذْ فَعَ بِالَّذِيهِ أَحْسَنُ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِذْ فَعَ بِالَّذِيهِ أَحْسَنُ First Allah says, وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ لَا لَا يَسْتَوِي لَا يَسْتَوِي لَا 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 تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةُ The good, Allah says the good and the evil are not the same.